Coffee Hour number 131. I'm coming to you this morning from the uh, Kaufman Kitchen space. I'm here with Peter Caddick on to my left, and Barry Price is back here as well. Uh, he's yeah, there he is. I'm hiding. <laughs> <laughs> We're here working on the setup and the system. Um, let's see. I wanted to. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, I've got a little video I'm going to show you that's from uh, last Saturday's open shop. Uh, which was a great success uh, as you'll see in the video uh let me see the next club meeting is january 3rd i think yeah, yeah. and then the next open shop will be the uh, second saturday which i is what 12th maybe uh, that'll be the next open shop um coffee hour is free and open to any woodturner who finds the link and wants to log on um at the same time, we do encourage you, who, those of you who enjoy coffee hour, to join our club. And it is due season here in Lancaster. Uh, dues are thirty dollars for the calendar year. You can make a check payable to Lancaster Woodturners and mail it to me, or you can, since I'm the club treasurer, or you can do it on PayPal. Uh, PayPal to my email address. That's J O H N K E L S E. No Y on the end of my name at Gmail, um, and that'll go right through and. Uh, and I'll get that into the club account and send you an acknowledgement. As of the, now, the middle of the month, half of y'all have uh, re-upped for the year. So our normal roster is 99 members. Um, we gained three this past week. And uh, we've got 47, 48 have paid their dues. So there you are. That's just about half. Any got a, anybody got any questions or comments about that? You can unmute yourself if you want to talk. Okay. Next open shop is the 14th, I believe. 14th of January is the next open shop. Um, I'm going to go right to that open shop video because it was it, it worked out pretty good. Um, I think I can do that this way. And I relieve the back. What do you think the angle is on that? Uh, about 40 degrees. And there's no way to bevel rub that. I just scrape. An end grain scrape, great. That's a touch. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be doing a deeper bolt. Mm -hmm. How do you sand? So Raffnick, he has um, he doesn't understand what the whole hubbub is about uh, negative rake scrapers. Mm -hmm. Because if you take this scraper and tip it up, it's a negative rake scraper. Right. Right. It just feels a little unwieldy. For sure. And you got to be careful how much edge you put in contact with the wood. So, I mean, there's two here that I know. It's like a brownish. Yeah. They call this, uh, this is a square end scraper, but it's not really square. Can you round it at all here? Well, that's because I ground it from yeah. another tool. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, I see. Um, uh, this one is... Richard Raffin's tools that I, I figured if I bought it, I'd have the karma. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it worked, right? No, it didn't. Uh, uh, 
but this is what he, what they or he calls a French curve scraper because okay, it's an yeah. irregular curve. Uh, it's not round, it's yep. more elliptical. Hmm. And what actually cuts is the little bevel on the top, right? Well, it's a burr a little on little the top. Burl, burl, yeah, right. there's a little burr. You can yeah. still feel it. It's still, yeah. because this yep. wood is yep. soft yep. and wet. It hasn't taken the burr away yet, but yeah. in that piece of walnut yeah. that you have, it would go yeah. pretty quick. Yeah. And now I'm back. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me again? Yes. Yes. Uh, I think what you saw there, what I want to point out there is you, we had three uh, world-class expert turners on lathes here willing to teach people and show people stuff. We had Cooter back doing a very, very delicate and exacting uh, spindle turning to template that he was then going to split in half and re-glue to make that roly-poly thing, a, a version of the streptohedron. Uh, we had Angelo, who's one of the best turners anywhere, uh, demonstrating how to turn a burl bowl and showing off scrapers. Uh, we had Doug, who worked with uh, Bill Major on a piece of wood that happened to have a screw in it that the tool kept hitting and we could hear it clickety click. Uh, and then we had a bunch of guys who were beginners and intermediates and Barry, Barry was here. No, Barry wasn't here. Matt, Matt was here. Uh, good turners and beginning turners just playing around together on the on four lathes. Um, and what we didn't have was enough beginners. We had a few beginners. We had as many experts. So people haven't quite caught on to the value of this Saturday morning thing that we're doing every month. Uh, but it's a hell of an opportunity to, to talk to people who really know what they're doing, see how they're working, ask them questions, and have them show you exactly what to do. Uh, this past Saturday, we had Doug with Tom Wenzel. Tom's a relative new turner, a beginner. Um, Doug's an expert turner, and Doug showed Tom how to get a real slick, smooth finish with a, a, a gouge on a spindle. And one of the things I noticed was that all these guys who came in, the experts, they all brought their own tools in a roll. So we're not going to have a huge quantity of tools here, but we are going to build up our chucks and centers and a basic kit of tools for each lathe. Uh, and they all used a spindle gouge. All three of these guys, whatever they were doing, were, was using a ladyfinger spindle gouge ground to about 40 degrees with the heel ground off. And I remember Richard Raffin used to always say, with a 3 8 inch spindle gouge, you can turn anything. And that's what we saw here on Saturday. So I just want to encourage anybody who's in range of Lancaster uh, or New Holland, really, to uh, take us up on this 9 to 1 Saturdays once a month. If, if it gets popular, we'll do it more than once a month. Um, come on out here to the Kaufman shop and um, improve your turning skills by getting some real instruction from some real experts. And all it costs you is your membership in Lancaster Wood Turners, 30 bucks for the year. What a deal. So that's my pitch. Um, and I'm going to take the spotlight off me now. The meeting is right here. Toby, you're asking where is uh, the meeting? It's at 250 Commerce Avenue, Commerce Drive in New Holland, PA. And the, the venue is Kaufman Kitchens. You look up Kaufman Kitchens online, you'll find their website, and you'll get a map to come here. Uh, New Holland's about 20 minutes from the edge of Lancaster City. At least takes me 20 minutes from home when I, I live on the edge of Lancaster City. Um, now I got to take the spotlight off me, and I got to remember how to do that. Take it back to remove it. Gallery view. How's that? Yeah. I don't know if it's removed or not. It is. it is. I removed it. Okay, you removed it. Good for you, Bowman. Thank you very much. How many have we got on screen here today? I'm seeing uh, 37, which is a nice number, plus three of us here. So that's like 36 of you guys out there, and three of us here is 39. We typically get around 40 on these coffee hours. Uh, while I'm talking, since I'm talking, I'm going to put the spotlight back on me because it's a show and tell morning, and you guys are all going to put up your hands to do show and tell. And I'm going to do a moment of that as well. How did I do that again? I'm going to spotlight myself. Yeah, spotlight for everyone. And then I've got to these. Here's what I've been making this week. I'm making these wee little pill boxes. For I, I, I learned there's a med I have to carry with me all the time. So I made this little guy just for that. Little wee, little wee box. Holds a couple of pills. Closes up. Throw it in your shirt pocket. And I made this one. This one. That one was paired with this one's boxwood. 
little box. I am really having fun with these. They're going to make a whole bunch more. The thing is to make this and this absolutely straight uh, and parallel to the lathe ways. And then you just make a little bump down at the bottom. And when you put the lid on, squish it down, it goes, squeezes down. And it's on there tight. You can put that in your pocket. It's not going to come off. So I think these are, this is boxwood. This, I think nothing's here more than about a little more than a 16th thick. So that's that's my project for the week, and that's my show and tell. What do you all got? Hey, Take John. You, hey, John. John. Yeah. Go ahead. Who's trying to talk? I, I was just wondering, where do you get the boxwood? Ah, where did I get the boxwood? Bowman, um, I... Some years ago, I met a young fellow whose uncle was a harpsichord maker living in an apartment on 14th Street in Manhattan. And I went there and he was he, he had this one room set up as a workshop and he was trying to unload his boxwood. He had logs of Turkish boxwood and I bought two. I wish I'd bought the whole lot, but I still have about one left. Uh, in Turkish boxwood is about three inches in diameter and I got about six feet of it. So I can make a whole lot of little boxes out of that. Hey, John, what I was going to tell you was if you made them smaller yet, you could have a time release capsule. Just put the pill in it and swallow <laughs> it and wait for the wood to eat away. So take the spotlight off me, Bowman, if you would. I will do that. There here, you go. Now we're back to the speaker view. Um, I promised Kai first slot here because he had a slideshow he wanted to give us last week. So I'm going to do that. Uh, where's my cursor? There we go. Kai, are you, you set? Yes, I am. Um, so I share my screen with you. Just see. Okay. Yep, we got it. Okay. Um, I think two weeks ago we talked about um, handles for tools that used kind of a, a collet device to um, hold the um, the tool inside the handle that came from, I think, the, the plumbing department of a DIY store. And um, a long time or some time ago, I, I talked about turning brass. And I said, I started off with making ferrules or inserts um, for handles. And someone said that might be interesting to have a closer look at. So I prepared a little PowerPoint showing this. And um, there is a warning, it's not suitable for people who are allergic to metalworking. In our German Zoom group, we have um, one guy from Berlin and whenever something has to do with um, working metal, he says, no, 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 I'm allergic to that, I won't do it. But at the end of my presentation, there's a solution for those people who are allergic um, to metal as well. So, or metalworking. Are you guys all good with Kai's volume? Is he speaking? Is it loud enough for you? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, here um, you can see what I'm going to talk about. Um, that's the the ferrule or um, insert um, that I made of brass rod, and here you can see the the same thing glued into a wooden handle. It has got two set screws to hold um, the, the tool. Um, you can use these inserts either for round or square tools. Um, if you use them for square tools, then the set screws have to be a little bit longer because you have to bridge this gap here. Also, I kind of round over the, um, the, the edge here or the corner or the edge of the, um, the high speed um, steel tool so that it doesn't dig into or cut into the, um, the brass. But um, with two set screws, um, square tools uh, work really fine. But are you using this to change tools in the same handle or are you making lots of handles for lots of tools? Um, I change um, tools um, between handles, but I try to make some more handles. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, some, some more handles with these inserts so that I don't have to change too often. Um, so, um, yeah, and they are fun to make, at least um, for me, they are. Right, um, the kind of set screws you can use, 
The ones I prefer are the brass tip set screws. So um, yeah. this brass tip um, doesn't um, kind of scratch or dig into the, the surface of your, your tool. And if you have a tight fit between the tool and the, um, the insert that you put into your handle, um, then um, the tool cannot be moved easily anymore if you have marks on the surface as, for example, they are left by this cone point set screw. So um, these um, work fine. If they have a flat um, point, they work fine as well. Not as good as the um, these, um, the, the brass ones, um, but you can still use them. Um, I even sometimes ground away the point from a cone point set screw to make it flat. And then um, I used it as well when I didn't have the right um, length of, of these um, brass tip set screws. Um, what I try to avoid, at least for this purpose, are cup point set screws because this cup, here are this um, edge of the cup, digs into the, the material. That's what it is meant to do, to keep something in, in one place very firmly. But for our purpose, you don't want this because you want to remove the tool from the handle or push it in or take it out a little bit more, depending on the overhang of the tool you need. So um, yeah, that is not that suitable. Of course, you can take a round bar and grind it flat on the top, and then you can use these um, because then you have um, a gap between your hole um, and the, the tool, and then um, it doesn't, doesn't matter if uh, this sticks into the surface of your tool. Right, um, in case there are any questions, please, um, please ask them right away. I had a look um, on the internet and I found um, several sources for these brass tip set screws um, in the States. So if you're looking for them, they should be available. Kai? Yes? Uh, couldn't have you uh, used uh, uh, fiber discs in place of the brass tip? A lot of the lathe manufacturers use that kind of thing for locking chucks in, I think, don't they? Um. Might be, yeah, you could could use something else. Um, with these brass tipped um, screws, the, the brass tip and the screw are firmly connected. So when you take out the screw completely, the brass tip won't fall out. So that is, um, that's really nice. That's a good point, thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point, so. I had uh, a lot of difficulty trying to source the brass tip set screws here in Canada. There was, a, there was quite a few places where you could buy them but the downside was is you had to buy a hundred and how many different sizes have you got? So what I did is I made my own. I just used a standard set screw and uh, the cup set screw with some a product called JB Weld Epoxy. And I turned this real small little brass disc and just epoxied it to my regular set screw and uh, bingo, I've got a source of brass tip set screws. Doesn't matter what size, just JB Weld the brass on and Go for it. Yeah, that's a good idea as they are um, a bit more expensive than the ordinary set screws as yep. well. So you, you save some money if you make your own. Well, my trouble right. is I got about five different sizes and I didn't want a hundred of each. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the, um, the way um, the handle looks in a, in a cross cut. Um, here is a larger hole to take the insert and then I drilled a smaller hole deeper into the handle so that I can move my tool in and out um, um, from off the handle, um, depending on the overhang or tool lengths I, I want. Um, Kai, so that is Kai, really handy. Kai, we're not to... seeing that drawing. It's pretty light. Um, yeah, it's light, but we can see it. I just wanted to say about the set screws. Um, Barry has makes Allen wrenches, makes handles on the Allen wrenches. So that you've got something you can actually get your handle on and your hand on and you can find it. So for situations like this, it becomes easy rather than fishing in a drawer among 500 Allen, Allen keys to find the right one. Yeah, that's right. Good um, idea. Yeah. 
I put yeah, a piece of uh, uh, deer antler on my well. Allen wrenches. Uh, the ones uh, that they stand out dramatically different. You got a piece of deer antler, just glue it on the end of the Allen wrench, and then you can always find it. Great tip. Okay. I have aluminum fer for ferrules instead of brass because it's much more available over here, at least, and a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't tried it yet. Um, there are different kinds of aluminum, aluminum, um, harder ones and softer ones. Um, so maybe when you shop for the aluminum, you have to make sure that you get the maybe the harder quality um, for that purpose. But um, I saw um, ready-made um, inserts and handles with inserts that that use um, aluminum. So that should be possible as well. Maybe what? Doc could comment on the uh, type of aluminum that would be best for machining. Uh, Doc out there? Doug, yeah, yeah, I, I am. I am over here on the aluminum land. Um, yeah, the, the there's some machining alloys that can get it. I I don't really know what's available through um, uh, through oh. the various um, suppliers or the distributors of aluminum ex for extrusions. Um, but I do know that at the plant I'm dealing, I'm working at, we produce an awful lot of um, aluminum for machining screw, machine screws and stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a six thousand series alloy that's actually designed for machining. So I can give you the names of various alloys, but I just don't know if they're available to you. Do you want me to just post that to you, John? And yeah, just the I'll numbers. And... Yeah. Okay. I'll put it in the notes. Yeah. Back to you, Kai. Yeah. Um, when I'm shopping for things like this, um, eBay is always a, a good source because people sell cutoffs of alum, aluminum rods or brass rods, stuff like that, quite cheaply. But then you never know what kind of quality you get. That's the, the problem. Right. So then there is a choice of round and square high speed steel bars that you can use to make your own tools um, when you want to grind your own tip to a scraper, for example, or of course you can um, use um, uh, ready-made um, tools without handles to um, put them into these inserts. Right, so now making them. First of all is um, marking out. I put my um, brass rod into a vise and I turned a little wooden disc that I can push over the brass rod and then I can draw a mark all around the rod, which gives me um, a nice um, mark for um, sawing. Then nice I use a hacksaw to cut it off. Some people use angle grinders, but I think hacksaw works fine, at least with brass, it's not too hard. Um, I use a file to deburr the, the ends from the sawing, and then I put it into um, a chuck on my um, wood turning lathe and I've got a little video of working the the end or planing the end. It's a bit kind of uneven from from sawing. That's the quality I can get <laughs> when I use a, a hacksaw and that's an ordinary um, scraper that I normally use for the inside of bowls or boxes. Uh, it's cutting on center line and it's hanging down a little bit. That's a good cut. And now you can hear that there's less chatter or noise when you cut along the surface. And yeah, that's the kind of surface quality you get. Um, so that's I do that on both ends. Bar. Yes, it, it does have a burr. It doesn't um, last too long, but it has got um, a burr. I don't take it away from, from grinding or when grinding. Have you tried carbide tips? Yes, I have. They work as well, but you don't need to have them. Okay. So um, the, um, the jaws I used in that chuck, this is an old Exminster chuck which actually is an, an engineering or an engineer's um, chuck from metalworking that they modified for, um, for wood turning. 
they are not available anymore. But what they sell nowadays, the SK100, for example, I think we talked about that one um, some time ago, um, that um, can also be used with these um, jaws that come from metalworking. So that's a, a good way to, to clamp the, um, the rod, or you can use um, a collar chuck, for example. So that's the end result. My um, stock here, cut to length and planed at the ends. And these are some of the shavings that I get from turning, sawing, foiling. I always collect them and then I use them for filling in holes that are in um, pen, pens, for example, pen planks or um, bowls or something like this mixed together with a um, super glue, they can be used um, again. So I never throw anything away. I, I try not to throw too much away. Right, so next step is um, drilling the hole that goes through it. Um, a, a small um, center drill as it is worked in, uh, used in metalworking works well for that purpose. I also use these center drills if I drill wooden pen planks. Um, so they give the, uh, the actual drill bit a nice um, starting point um, because they are really short, they don't flex and um, you hit the, the center easily. So I can show that. Okay, and that only goes in a few millimeters. Then um, I take the, the center drill out and put um, the um, drill with the appropriate diameter into the chuck and drill the hole in a similar way as you would drill into wood. So you have to, to remove the, the drill frequently um, to um, get the shavings out of the, um, the hole. Are you using any lube with that, any oil or cutting oil? Um, well, you could, in this case, I don't, um, but um, you could do that. The only drawback is that you have the, the oil on your, your lathe bed together with the shavings later on. Um, if it's not absolutely necessary, I try to avoid it, but whenever I drill steel, I, I use it and for brass, you don't have. I um, have a test fit with um, the bits that I want to use um, and if they fit nicely, I go on. Okay, and here you can see the, the hole on both sides. So I um, hit the, the middle. Um. Right, so Let's go on. Then I mark out the position of my um, holes or threads where I want to have the, the set screws um, later on. I've got um, a marking gauge that I once bought at a car boot sale, but you could also use um, a flat bit of strip of wood and then of the right thickness and then just make your marks. And before marking, I use some Sharpie to um, make the surface a little bit darker here. Then you can see your scratch marks easily. Well, that's nothing special for metal workers. Okay, then I center punch the, the holes or the position of the holes. Then I drill them. Um, I fix my vise to the drill press table and um, also lock the table in, in one position so um, that the vise and my workpiece don't move anymore. And then I do the drilling. And in the same position, I use my, my tap or thread cutter here, um, put it into the, the chuck, turn the chuck by hand to start um, cutting the, the thread or tapping the tapping process. And then once it is started and um, the, the tap is aligned, um, I remove the chuck and then I use this, this um, 
tapping wrench, I think it is called, um, to um, wind in the, the tap by, by hand. And that gives um, normally a nice um, um, thread that has got the, the right direction. So you're um, using the drill press to align that thread cutting tool. You're yes, yes. And also to start the, the, the thread. So you, I take out the, the drill bit, put in my tap, um, move the, the tip of the tap down here, and then I turn the, um, the drill chuck by hand and the tap will start cutting the, the thread into the, um, the, the brass. And then I open the chuck, um, remove it, and then I put my, my wrench on top of the, the um, tap and then on. I turn it by hand. You are not turning the drill press on with the tap. No, you. it's not possible with my drill press. There are drill presses that you can use for that, but they have to turn really slowly. And um, my um, is just an ordinary um, drill press that where, where the speed is too high for, for something. Well, I just like want that. to make sure nobody, nobody gets the idea that you're running the tap in a drill press because that would be a bad idea. Yes, it is. It is. So I just turn it by hand, and the the, the idea behind it is to um, to get the um, the tap at or to get the, um, the thread cut at a right angle to uh, my um, my workpiece. So to to align things. If you do it by eye and by hand, you can be lucky, but um, sometimes I messed it up. So that's the the safer method. Kai, it's good to mention that you're using a machinist vice to keep everything aligned. Um, that's a very valuable tool right there. Yeah. I even, um, before I put in the, um, the drill, I have a little bit of round steel with a point that I put into the drill chuck. And with a point, um, I um, align the... Um, now I align the, um, no, I align the, the punched hole, this one, yeah. I align the punched hole, hole with this um, point um, tool that I put into my drill chuck. So then I have the direction right. Then I put the, the drill into the chuck, do the drilling, and then the tap into the chuck to start the, the thread without the, the drill press um, switched on, yeah. Okay, so um, next I turn the um, the step into the um, into the the brass um, workpiece, and this is something where you have to be aware of your fingers. Um, when I watched this video again, um, I saw that it's quite a dangerous process, and you should only do it when you are happy working that close to a metal working chuck. Um, you could kind of um, put either masking tape or um, a ru white rubber band or something around the jaws here. I saw some people using even um, a board that has just a hole in the middle that they put down here and then um, they fix it to the, um, the bed ways of the lace so that you cannot um, get your hands or your tool into these turning jaws. So here you have, should be really careful. Um, that's not good practice what I'm showing here, um, I guess. And again, the, the same um, scraper. I take very light passes um, along the, the bar or the workpiece. So take your time if you do that and remove layer after layer until you get the, the right um, diameter. Now you're a millimeter away from that chuck jaw. It, it, it's a little bit more, it looks more dangerous in the video than it is actually, but um, again, you have to be careful. Uh, okay. Kai, do you, Kai, Kai, do you use any carbide scrapers like the little round head ones as opposed to the one you've got or does it really, oh, there yeah. you go. That's, that's a carbide one because with the round tool you cannot get into the corner. 
So that works as well. And that is carboid, yes. That one feels safer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, then I test fit. I just drilled a hole with the same drill that I use for drilling my wooden tool handle to, to check the fit. Um, actually, this needs to be made a little bit thinner. I don't want to show that now because um, it's the um, yeah, the same same process as before. Once it's finished, I put some grooves into the um, the surface to give the the glue some more grip. And that also works nicely. And I chamfer the the end a little bit so that it. It's easier to, to um, push it into the handle. OK. Actually, diameters don't have to be really precise here, because um, if you need, if you use epoxy, for example, to glue it into the handle, the epoxy will fill gaps as well. So OK. Do you modify your uh, the larger size drill that you use for boring, like the three eighths or? Uh, no. Modify the lip on the front of the drill. No, I I didn't. I just used them right out of the box. Uh, the the nature of the uh, crystal, if you will, in brass, uh, that it's different than every other metal, and if you dub the, uh, the lip on larger size bits so that instead of having a rake, you know, spiraling up, it has a blunt face, uh, a zero degree rake. Mm -hmm. it does not pull itself into the brass, uh, which could become dangerous. Okay. So the on the brass will self feed. Right. And that drill bit is just like putting a, a negative rake on a scraper. Yeah, you take a diamond file and uh, or a, a diamond hone and just a tiny bit, just knock off the uh, the angle on the lip, so it's got a it, it's approaching the metal with a ninety degree face. Yeah. Okay. Are there more slides, Kai? Or are we in the slides? Yes. Yes. Uh, I I go quickly. Sorry. I oh, know, I know, it's fine. I just didn't want to end your share prematurely. That's all. Yeah. Okay. So that's the the result then. And last step is um, is polishing. I can kind of speed that up a little bit. Um, yeah. First, um, sanding up to maybe six hundred grit, and then some polishing compound to make it nice and shiny. That's not not necessary for the function. It just looks nice. Okay. So that's the, uh, sorry, that's the end result then. Um, and um, I've also got them for, for bigger tools. Um, and um, I don't make these myself. I've got a, a friend who does um, model engineering and he's got a, a metal turning lathe and he uh, made, um, made these inserts for me. Um, this, for example, is for a half inch um, tool and even bigger holes um, for heavier tools when hollowing out um, are pos possible. Yeah, I also used two screws with that. I, I did the tapping myself, um, but he turned the, the metal bits. So normally there's someone in your wood working club or wood turning club or someone you know who can help you there if you need um, metal ones or steel ones. Hi, okay. you, com you commented about um, making it look nice and with a uh, fine polish. Do you put any? Do you ever varnish it just to for keep the shine on it, just to, out of curiosity? No, no, I didn't. Well, that might be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, I, this is, it's easy enough yeah. to do. I just wanted to know. Yeah, no, I didn't do that. But um, with time, of course, um, the shine will will go. Yeah, you will lose the the, the shiny surface um, with brass if you don't polish it again. 
Yeah, and with this handle, for example, it's it's got a long hole inside as well, and I made it by um, by ra uh, by um, using two um, halves um, that I glued together for the tool handle, and before I glued them together, I routed um, a slot in each um, of the two halves, so that I've got a kind of a a hole going far into um, the handle. And then I turned it on the lace um, and, and drilled my hole here. So um, I can push this tool into the handle as well and take it out. It's easier for me then than drilling a deep hole on the, on the lace. So, and you can buy these uh, or similar brass inserts, for example, from Packard Woodworks um, in the States. They sell a system by Hosserluck, I guess it's Michael Hosserluck um, who um, invented them or who, who made them first. And um, he sells um, a handle with insert, but you can also buy the inserts and make your own handles, wooden handles for them. And um, yes, they, they come in different, with different hole sizes. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Hey, so this is Rich Colvin. I, I have a basic question about the idea of inserts like you're doing here. What, what's the reason for going to this versus just using a wooden handle and putting a, a tool into it, you know, the traditional method? What, what's the value that this gives you? I, I, I'm not questioning um, it, I'm just wondering myself why you would want to do this. Um, one advantage is that you um, just go back that you can vary the um, the two lengths you have outside the tool handle um, so you get a more stable tool if you can push it further into the handle and the overhang is not too um, too big um, that kind of lessens by vibration um, for example with this um, following tool that's um, a pro form um, tool um, like a like a hook tool, um, yeah. So that is one advantage. Another advantage is if you demonstrate wood turning, for example, or travel, um, carry your tools around, you can get away with maybe two or three handles and more tools, and then you can um, exchange the the tools. Um, you can have tools that have um, different. Um, cutting tips at both ends. So you can just turn the tool around if you want to have another um, cutting tip. So there are some advantages, but for me, it's most interesting that you can um, kind of have a different lengths here um, or only what you need um, for um, your, your draw. So that, um, that thing, I think is, is quite a big advantage there. I, could I add something, Kai? It's Doug here. Um, I Did find that I, I use those handles. Doug. Kai, would you end the share, please? I can't get at it. Yeah. For I, I will do it. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I end up using the handles for tools I don't use so frequently because it takes less storage space to put the blades in one drawer, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to have everything. So having a thousand tools with handles all over the shop. Having all the blades in one drawer just makes a lot less storage space in my shop. But I, I definitely ha don't use the tools. If I'm using a, a one cool tool I use commonly, I, I have that on a handle all the time because I'm not changing it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with, with very long handles for deep hollowing, um, I've also got um, extensions that I can put into the, the insert and then I put my tool into the extension. So that is maybe another advantage that um, you can use kind of um, extensions for tools um, if you um, need a very um, strong tool for a large overhang over the tool rest. I also find they're much, much easier to sharpen without a big handle on them. I, I find that a huge advantage. Yeah, that's another advantage, of course. Yeah, I didn't think of that, but I also do that. I take them out of the handle, especially if I use uh, a sharpening um, jig like my, my Tormac, for example, um, then um, a long handle gets into the way. Yeah. Bruce, hey, just, I, I think, I just mentioned something here about uh, extension on the handles. Uh, that handle that Michael Hosselock makes, 
he makes an extension handle to add to the other end of the handle that comes with yeah. it. His son makes the handles. Okay. So that's where they come from. Yeah. So it's, well, it is Michael Hosserlock um, who um, does yes. the, the inserts and the handles. Yeah. yeah, right. One other thing I just wanted to mention here, you were talking about lubrication. I can remember way back when I was in school, my shop instructor taught me, use lubrication with steel, but not brass, with aluminum, but not cast. Mm -hmm. You can remember that. There's your, what you use lubrication on when the, on the machining. Mm -hmm. Use lubrication with steel, but not brass, with aluminum, but not ca cast. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I did it right then without the, um, the lubrication. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for aluminum, you can use... Um, oil or cutting, um, cutting oil. Saturated alcohol, I think it is, um, for, for yeah, cooling sure. the, the drill bit. We you can use paint thinner, thinner, Barry says. Yeah. Mineral spirits. Mineral yeah. spirits, okay. Any more on this? Kai, that's a wonderful presentation and a lot Very of information. Good. Here in the States, uh, small quantities of brass, aluminum, steel, uh, tool steel uh, can be purchased from uh, McMaster Car, and you can easily find them on the internet. Uh, they're great people to deal with, fast service, uh, very reasonable prices too. Yeah. Todd Raines uh, has his own uh, tool site he sells from, and I bought some, looks very similar to what Kai, you were making. I just didn't have the time or energy or want to do it. So I bought them from him. His have a a quarter, inch and a quarter, number eight thread on the end. So you got to tap your wood handle and then screw it in. Uh, okay. It worked, but you have to be careful how you screw it in. So. Anybody okay. else on this topic? It's a great topic. A lot of interest in making tools. We do have a few minutes left, so I'm going to say thank you very much, Kai, and yeah. I'm going to give give the spotlight over to Ron, who has not been here for a while. What do you got today, Ron? Yeah, I've been I was away last week and been busy in the shop and whatever. Uh, a couple three weeks back, Sarah had a had a a uh, piece of wood she wanted. She thought it was a burl. It looked like a burl, but she brought it over and we cut it up. Uh, you, I got to end that video background. This mess. Yeah, you got to get rid of that back, or else hold that in front of your body. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a spot so there. Anyway, I, I cored the thing out. Uh, we we. Is that Sarah's piece of wood? Off. Is that Sarah's piece of wood? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is. This, uh, let's see if I can get that. Hey, you should kill your background. Just kill your background. Uh, I got to. I got to. Anyway, uh, the the big piece is uh, over 16 inches. Where's the background? It's on video, the video. Select the video to carry it and uh, you'll see background. Background and yeah. effects. Yeah, choose oh. virtual background. You got to go there and choose none. Okay. That's it. Now you can hold that up again so we can get a good yeah. look at it. Uh, so anyway, I got a 16 and a half. I don't know how deep it was, about nine inches deep. This one I have here is the second one. And well, just a sec. Did you did you do this work for Sarah, or did Sarah do this work with you? How did all that work? No, I I did this one because she only has a fourteen inch swing, so I'm I'm on a powermatic twenty inches. So this is five inches by thirteen and a half, and this is the this is the second piece, and then I got two smaller pieces about thirteen and a half, and a smaller one that. that Sarah has. I don't know whether she did anything with him or not. I see she's on here today. One thing I wanted to point out, I think you can see it there now. Where this, where is it? Right here, where this, where this line goes down through there. It almost yeah. looks like two pieces of wood. Yeah. Were put together there. The grain, the grain is running this way, up here, up to that line, and then it's running this way above it. Uh, it's the strangest thing I've ever seen. Uh, the Let's thing hear really heavily spalted, uh, almost to the point where it was much longer. I think it would have been gone because the, the bigger piece, especially, really soft, and I had trouble uh, 
shear scrape and everything, and I can generally do a pretty good job with that. Uh, and I do a little bit of sand, and I got most of the tear out out of it, but there's still a little bit in it. And I put four coats of water locks on this, and it's still sucking it up pretty heavily. So I'm going to put at least another one or two coats on this. So Sarah, were you involved in this, or did Ron just take your wood and do it for you? Well, I was there for the coring of it and getting that piece of wood and figuring out how we were going to get the most out of it. Um, this piece of wood is from my a, a friend of mine. Her family has a cabin that's been in their family forever, and they took down this tree, and she's had this burl for, and I don't know where she stored it, but she's had it for five years. And when she heard that I was learning how to turn, she said, can you do something with it? Which it was way too big for me to handle. So Ron helped me out and figured out how to get four bowls out of this piece of wood and really unique figuring in it. It's, it's pretty, it's beautiful. So thank you, Ron. That looks amazing. Do you, do you know, was this like a growth on the side of the tree, like a burl? Yes, it was. Yeah, I, you know, we, I looked at it. it is, there are no burl eyes in this. That's why I, I hesitate to call it a burl, but it, it obviously grew like a burl or whatever it is, but it's, it's just extremely spalted. And uh, I mean, I've seen spalted wood before with a lot of spalting in it, but nothing like this. Now, have you got okay. the other pieces, Sarah? Or have you turned them yet? I haven't. So I haven't, I have my lathe. Um, set up finally. Um, but it's been a while since I've done any turning and I'm, I'm very nervous to do it and mess it up. So I was hoping so, to go to the open shop and I was all, I had everything ready to go that morning. I had a friend that had an emergency, so I wasn't able to attend and I was really sad about that. So, so I, what, I are need, you gonna, what do you need to get your courage up or do you need somebody with you? What has to happen here? Yeah, well, I, I just, told her I'll come over there, but she, she hasn't <laughs> invited me yet. Well, Ron, yeah, you can come on over. I, um, I, I'm, I'm just nervous to do it. I just want somebody there to kind of guide me through it because I, I don't want to mess it up. It's such um, a, an amazing piece of wood, and this means a lot to this family. So I, I certainly don't want to, um, you know, to do anything that would damage it or mess up the project. Well, you're going to get the bowls Ron made. Is that right? Yeah. Is Ron keeping that as his souvenir? <laughs> yeah. well um I, oh, I guess we'll have to talk about that yeah. um but yeah the, that looks amazing ron thank you so much for your help yeah yeah uh so the one the one piece is hollowed, hollowed out the, the, the inner piece is still solid is that right I yes remember. yeah yeah so you have a little hollow and do that but yeah anytime you want me to come down i'll be happy to help you out hey ron what did you use to core it what? I have a uh, one-way coring system. I oh, have, you have the one knives. I can do an you know eighteen or nineteen inch piece. I can okay. swing twenty on the paramatic. I have done. I have used the four inch knife on a big piece a while back. But I almost never use the number number four knife. This this one, I used the number three knife on the outside, and then uh, actually I think I used the number three on the inside on this one too. And then I went to the number two and made a took a core out of that. So I usually you, start with a three on a on a uh, 13, 14 inch blank. I'll I'll start with the number three and then then the two and some, usually I use the one also and get a little little five or six seven inch bowl out of it. So you're starting from the big piece and coring pieces out of it. You don't start in the middle and core out a small piece and then a bigger. Oh, piece. I did that one time. I made too many funnels. Uh, okay. well, it, it's a challenge to know how deep to go, where to set your depth on your second or your third knife. And when I ruined the big piece, I thought, I'm not doing it this way. I know where the face of my chuck is, and I know when a knife swings around with nothing on there, I can be an inch away. So that's what I do. And I set up a mark. I have a, a spacer that locks up the, the guide to the base of the coring system so that it's going to give me a one inch bottom and I know that and I'm going to get the big bowl to cord out of there I'm going to get a core out of there and the big bowl is going to have an inch bottom so uh that's you know that's the way I work it and then I go to the next one I again I'm going to get a one inch bottom out of it so 
So Sarah threw something up here. So this is what it looked like to start. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, we yeah. got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we cut it down. Oh, she was shooting pictures while we were doing the <laughs> doing the oh, trim. Cool. Yeah, we like that. Yeah. So this is kind of what we started with. So it was it was big. I don't think you can tell how big this was. Yeah. Oh, she's got some live action shots here. Yeah, it had a it had that angle trim on there when they cut it with a chainsaw. They they knocked that angle off of it. So uh, I think I got it out of there, but. So one of the things that this family wants is their the name of the camp that they have on this ledge. They love this ledge, Ron. They wanted me to keep oh, it. So okay. um, that that's one of the things I was trying to find um, a friend with the CNC that maybe we could get something on there. I mean, I can do it by hand, but again, I'm I don't want to mess it up. Well, you could burn it on there pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. mess it up, clean it off, and do it again. Yeah, I do a lot of wood burning with that. Uh, okay, so the find somebody with a little laser pecker laser. Uh, they're they're amazing for doing those kind of jobs. They're small, they're portable, and they does a beautiful <laughs> job of burning. Yeah, really, really simple. Ray has one of those, I think. I'm not or, sure, but I think. Uh, or do what Doug does. He uses archival pens to write it on. That's yeah, what I, I do. have three of those too. I can do you know I can do it that way too. Uh, Sarah's enough of an artist; she could do that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, we'll get some pieces to practice on. So, how many more cores did you get out of that? Two, three? I got. I, I have the sixteen and the fourteen, and Sarah has fourteen and a twelve. I guess that's a lot of cores out of one one big lump. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten five. Five is about as most as I ever get out of them. Hey, Ron. Uh, Bull Savers coring device, they have a jig that they sell with theirs because theirs adjusts by how far in you are. That helps you with that idea of cutting through the bottom. I've had the same thing with the Minolton from Doug. I cut through a couple bottoms and ah, that was bad news. So Yeah, no, I never do that anymore. We're, we're nearly up on the hour here and I got two more hands up here. Uh, if you guys have announcements, we'll take them. If you're gonna show pictures, we'll have to ask you to come back. Not next week, because there won't be a coffee hour next week due to Christmas, but the week after, the week in between Christmas and New Year's, we will have coffee hour. Uh, Ellen Miller, I accidentally took your hand, Ray, lowered your hand. So if you had something you wanna say. This is, an, we could do announcements. Toby, <laughs> here's the slideshow. I, I just have some things to show. I'll wait. Okay. How about you, Randy? Uh, I just have a question. A, a friend of mine lives in Lebanon and is looking for a place to purchase uh, hardwoods. Uh, I think he's making uh, so, uh, small boxes and things like that. This will be flat work, not turning. Groff and Groff. Drive down to Quarryville to Groff and Groff. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was probably the good closest place they're fabulous they got such a wonderful selection of stuff and they're very helpful yeah okay that was it thank you okay well we're right on the hour so i'm going to say uh thank you all for attending this week and i i hope you heard me a minute ago no coffee hour next week but we'll be back the week after that i'm going to be traveling next week for christmas to spend christmas with my children and grandchildren or some of christmas anyway and I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas with whoever you choose to spend it with. And we'll see you all uh, on the brink of the new year on the December 29th. the 29th. Have a nice hey, Christmas, John. everyone. Thanks, John. Wood shop. Thank God for wood. <laughs> <laughs>